Welcome back. During this COVID-19 crisis, the Miami Herald has exposed horrendous conditions inside ICE detention centers. Herald reporter Monique Madden has forced ICE to acknowledge there are detainees and staff that have tested positive. In a few minutes, you will hear from a former director of ICE during the Obama administration on the situation. But we begin with Jessica Schneider, an attorney with Americans for Immigrant Justice. I ask her to describe what is happening inside the detention centers. It seems that the situation is pretty dire. People are terrified. They're afraid of their lives. They, they want to do everything that they can to, you know, protect themselves um, from, from contracting COVID-19. I mean, think about all the efforts that we as individuals are going through every single day to social distance, to, you know, wiping our groceries off when Instacart delivers it or whatever the case may be. Now, imagine not having any control whatsoever over your own health and well-being right? And you can imagine the anxiety that that leads to. And we did see reports of um, a couple of protests that broke out at Chrome. I think mainly my understanding is that, um, you know, they, ICE keeps on bringing people in and out of facilities, you know, despite the guidance that they put out on March 18th, um, they've still been arresting people. They've still been transferring people um, between facilities. And I think any time that a new person comes in, I think the people that are detained are, are, are very afraid and rightfully so that that might be the person that is, you know, could potentially be the one that's, that's carrying the virus. And um, I believe that, you know, individuals were also protesting because they all wanted to be tested. I mean, I think that any of us would want to be tested if we found out that, you know, somebody that we had come into contact with, um, you know, tested positive for COVID-19. And so, um, you know, the, the mood, um, I would say, is one of anxiety, one of panic, one of desperation. I mean, I think all of the things that all of us are feeling right now during this, you know, trying time of this, you know, really international global pandemic and crisis, and you can imagine that that is only further exemplified um, or exasperated rather, um, you know, by individuals that are, are, are locked up um, with no way to really protect themselves from the virus. Doing the type of work that you do, you know that it's often difficult to get the public to care about what happens to, to the folks you represent. Uh, that there's often resentment or anger or, or just, you know, a general dismissal of their needs or concerns. Why should the public care about what's happening in, in these facilities? An excellent question. I mean, I'd like to point out that immigration detention is civil. It's not criminal. So individuals are there, you know, for immigration purposes, administrative purposes, right? And ICE has the discretion to be able to release them, right? Um, and they're human beings, just like you and me. Many of them have been, you know, our, our neighbors, part of our community. Um, and you know, I think that we should care as, as human beings, right, that others are not sick. Um, and I would say, you know, aside from that, um, what happens in these detention centers and jails, whether they be immigration detention centers or whether they be local county jails, affects our community as well. Um, you know, if there is a massive outbreak of COVID-19 at one of these facilities because people aren't able to engage in social distancing, then what does that mean? That means that a bunch of people are then transferred over to local hospitals and that our local hospitals are even more overrun, right? What does that mean when there are guards and other contract workers that are coming in and out of the facilities, you know, that then might, you know, contract the virus and then bring it back home to their families? And so um, I think the idea is that, you know, when we keep one of us safe, we're keeping all of us safe from the virus, right? And so um, that's the reason why we're all being asked to social distance right now. Um, and it's the same reason why I should be releasing people so that they can engage in self-quarantining and social distancing, you know, with their families and other, other members of their community. Because, you know, what happens in a detention center or a jail affects all of us. John Sandwood worked at the Department of Homeland Security for five years, including a stint as the acting director of ICE. While Jessica Schneider looks at this from the perspective of the detainees, Sandwig has a different concern. I view this as an officer's safety first and foremost. Every single day, 
ICE agents and officers need to go into those detention facilities to do their job. It's not just them as well. There are other employees and contract employees. Now, when you have a pandemic or, or an outbreak in a facility, you're exposing those officers to the virus. Now they not only are running risk to themselves, but also to bring it home to their families uh, and into their communities. So look, the way in which ISIS handles this gives me a lot of concern, beginning first with the safety of the officers. And when, when I worked at ICE, when I was at DHS, that was the most critical element of your job. Before everything else, you gotta protect the workforce, protect the health and safety of your officer corps. And I, I'm deeply concerned that by refusing to take some common sense steps to shrink the population down, we've really created a situation where we risk exposure to a lot of employees. Why is it important for ICE to decrease theirs and how could they actually decrease their populations in their detention facilities? That's right. Everyone, everyone who is in the detention business who operates jails, whether that's you know, county sheriffs or the Department of Justice, recognizes the threat that the close confinement in these facilities has to allow the spread of the disease. It's, it's really just the exact opposite of the social distancing that we're all engaged in right now. You are generally cramming multiple individuals into a cell, uh, and when they are allowed to leave that cell, they have to go into a pod area where you're where a number of other cells feed in. So you're never in a situation where you're outside that close confinement. So what everyone has been doing is what I recommend that ICE does, is shrink down the population to a more manageable size so you can at least engage in some basic social distancing. The, the frustration here is that despite the fact that the ICE population is not predicated on public safety or flight risk concerns, the way our immigration detention system works is, there are, it, you know, a lot of, in a lot of contexts, it really, you're, whether you're going to be detained or not depends on where you were arrested, uh, but also on whether or not you have the money to post bond. So roughly half, this, this number fluctuates, but really roughly half to more than half of the people who are in ICE detention currently have no criminal history, maybe never even been arrested for a criminal offense, uh, and have never been convicted of a crime. ICE would be the first to agree with you that the majority of the people in their custody pose no threat to public safety. So what should ICE do about this? Well, it's pretty simple. We can cut down the population by simply screening those individuals based on public safety criteria, something that ICE does every day. If someone's booked in detention, we conduct a risk assessment. Conduct a basic risk assessment. Identify those individuals who either have no criminal history whatsoever, or if there is a criminal history, it's something minor and certainly something nonviolent. Uh, and then release those individuals. Now, I get where people could be frustrated. They might think, well, this guy's trying to say we shouldn't deport anyone. I'm not saying that at all. Deportations will continue. Um, the fact is just because you're released doesn't mean you're free to remain in the United States. ICE is very, very good at monitoring individuals who've been released to prevent them from fleeing. If they flee, ICE will go out and get them. So through the use of things like electronic monitoring, ankle bracelets, check-ins, all of the tools that ICE has that currently uses, frankly, to keep an eye on hundreds of thousands of individuals who are going through the deportation process but are not being detained, we can apply those same tools. So again, what doesn't make any sense to me is in an era when you have the Bureau of Prisons releasing criminals, when you have state and local jails releasing criminals, and they're doing it because they want to keep their workforce safe, they want to avoid a, a catastrophic outbreak in a facility, it makes no sense why ICE would not do the exact same thing, especially with a population that poses far fewer public safety risks than those that are in prisons and jails. Why do you think there's a reluctance on the part of ICE to do that? Well, look, I, in my experience, you know, both when I was at the Department of Homeland Security and then when I was actually running ICE myself, is the agency does not want outbreaks of infectious diseases in their facilities. It is, they understand the threat to the officers. They also understand that it's a real drain on the agency resources, and it's very difficult to deal with those pandemic or, or any sort of outbreak of infectious diseases. Um, so look, I, I can only assume, and I'm not privy to knowing exactly, but I assume that this is the administration. Uh, the administration and their position on being tough on immigration doesn't want us to be seen as softening that in any way. And that, what concerns me here now though, is we're jeopardizing the, the safety and the welfare of ICE officers and agents who are putting their lives on the line every day, really to help keep us a little bit safer for the politics. That, that's what concerns me. How difficult would it be to try to maintain social distancing or, or, or what an outbreak could look like in a facility like Rome if it actually got hold in there? Well, it's impossible to maintain social distancing. We, we use the term detention centers, you know, and ICE detention. The reality is, first of all, almost half the detention beds operated by ICE are really county jails. Secondly, though, is in the, in the contract facilities like Chrome and like 
you know, other facilities across the country. The design is the exact same as a jail. It, it's a jail. You have cells where you have a couple of bunks or, or maybe even more, and then you know, they feed into what's called a pod, you know, a community gathering area that's pretty small. You cannot, when you're operating at 90 to 95 percent capacity, which is where ICE currently is, you cannot engage in any social distancing. It's virtually impossible to remain six feet apart from anyone unless you reduce the population down so you can have single individuals in cells. I think the other thing you mentioned too, though, is look, the struggle that we're all having to get basic supplies, when we go to our grocery stores and there's food not on the shelves, that's the same logistical issues that are causing that are impacting the detention facilities. You're going to have people who are cognizant of the threat saying, I just don't want to come to work today. So you have reduced staffing that creates additional security concerns. It can reduce the food supply, the cleaning services. I mean, all of that kind of is going to impact. So when you tell me there's stories of shortages or detainees being forced to clean themselves, of course, it's not surprising in, in the slightest. But I do think it's important for people to realize that these are not detention centers. Again, these are supposed to, you know, these are civil facilities, so we use a different terminology. But these are jails. That's exactly what they are. Here. Look, I think if the American public understood, there are certain things that need to occur that we have to do. We need ICE officers out there on the streets arresting dangerous individuals, you know, and taking them, you know, showing that they are set free in our communities during this pandemic. But we don't need to take needless risks. And if you looked at the population and understood that there are thousands of individuals that not don't take my word for it, but ICE agents would agree, do not pose a threat to public safety. And that by releasing those individuals, we are not giving them a free pass to stay in the United States. They will still be deported. Um, they will still go through the deportation process like everybody else and, and return to their home country. All I'm saying is let's shrink the population down at this moment just to protect the, the health and safety of the workforce and the officers and agents who are already risking enough. Um, and there's no consequence, there's no real cost to our larger society because these people aren't threatening and they will still be deported. It just, it's just common sense. When we come back, we'll put a human face on this story. 